Concord was incorporated as the first inland settlement in Massachusetts in 1635. The town of about 18,000 is home to significant people and milestones in American history. Chief among these is the so-called shot heard round the world, the first battle of the American Revolution on April 19, 1775. Concord is rich in literary history, as home to many current authors, such as Doris Kearns Goodwin, as well as being the home of Louisa May Alcott, Henry David Thoreau, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and Ralph Waldo Emerson. There are many houses in Concord that were stops on the Underground Railroad. The Alcotts, Thoreaus, and Emersons were all anti-slavery activists. Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, Lewis Hayden, William Lloyd Garrison, and John Brown all visited and spoke in Concord. The Robbins House is a 544-square-foot historic early 19th century house formerly inhabited by the first generation of descendants of formerly enslaved African-American Revolutionary War veteran Caesar Robbins and by fugitive slave Jack Garrison. Concord is home to the Minuteman National Park, which includes the five-mile Battle Road Trail, which follows the remains of the route of the day-long first battle of the American Revolution. You can walk or bike the entire trail or do sections from regularly spaced parking lots. In the months leading to April 19, 1775, tensions across the colony of Massachusetts reached a boiling point. The previous summer, British warships closed Boston Harbor, and General Thomas Gage, the royal governor, dismissed the elected Massachusetts legislature. In October, Patriot leaders called for a provincial congress in Massachusetts. Towns across Massachusetts chose to send representatives to this essentially illegal body, which immediately proceeded to assume political power. They took control of the colony's militia force and began stockpiling arms, ammunition, and provisions. Following the advice he received from his superiors in England, General Gage decided to send a force of 700 soldiers on a secret expedition into the countryside to seize and destroy arms and supplies and disrupt the colonists' preparations. His target was the town of Concord. That night, a young man of Lexington, Solomon Brown, who had been to market in Boston, arrived home with news that he had been overtaken and passed by a patrol of British officers on the Bay Road. Brown reported his observations to Sergeant William Monroe. Monroe collected eight men from his militia company and posted a guard at the Hancock Clark House, where John Hancock and Samuel Adams were then lodging. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith assembled his roughly 700 soldiers for an 18-mile march into the hostile Massachusetts countryside to seize and destroy rebel military supplies, then return that day to Boston. But Dr. Joseph Warren had the news almost before the British had left their barracks. He sent for Paul Revere and William Dawes. Concerned about the route that the British would march, Dawes was dispatched over the longer route to Lexington via Boston Neck. Revere planned to row across the Charles River and then proceed to Lexington. Their plan was to meet in Lexington and warn John Hancock and Sam Adams, who were staying there while the Provincial Congress was in recess. From there, they would continue on to raise the alarm in Concord. By 12.30 in the morning of the 19th, Revere and Dawes had rendezvoused in Lexington and warned Adams and Hancock. Revere and Dawes then determined to continue to Concord and warn every household along the way. Soon after starting for Concord, they met Dr. Samuel Prescott, who agreed to ride with them and help. On this spot is the memorial to where Paul Revere was riding around 200 yards ahead of William Dawes and Samuel Prescott when he was surprised by two mounted British officers in the road. Dawes turned around and escaped. Prescott jumped his horse over a fence, evaded capture, and made it to Concord. Sometime around 1.30 in the morning, Samuel Prescott arrived in Concord and raised the alarm. The town immediately turned out its two-minute companies and two militia companies who mustered on the town center near the meeting house. Colonel James Barrett, who was responsible for safeguarding the military stockpiles in town, began detaching men from their companies to assist in removing or hiding any of the stores that had not already been removed a few days prior. 
Ferrying all 700 British soldiers across the Charles River took over three hours. By 2 a.m., the column finally began to march, many of them cold, wet, and miserable. With the sounds of alarm heard around them, bells ringing, guns firing, any hope of secrecy was lost. By 5 a.m., the British had approached the town green in Lexington and discovered Captain Parker's company of about 77 men formed up and in the open. Someone somewhere off the green fired a shot. The light infantry then rushed into the green with bayonets and fired upon the retreating militia. Eight militiamen died on the town common in Lexington. Ten others were wounded. With the alarm spreading all morning, Minute and militia companies continued to arrive in Concord, with two companies from Lincoln and more men from Bedford and Acton. When the regulars entered Conquer, the militia, outnumbered three to one, retreated back along the ridge towards town, then over the North Bridge to a hill nearly a mile beyond. There they waited for reinforcements. The British then moved to secure both the North and South Bridges. Securing the bridges was necessary to prevent rebels from slipping across from remote parts of the town to threaten the mission. Lieutenant Colonel Smith sent seven companies across the North Bridge with orders to search for supplies and artillery thought to be hidden at Barrett's farm. They left three companies at the bridge to guard it and keep it open for their return. With their numbers now exceeding 400 men, the decision was made to march to the North Bridge and engage the British soldiers there. Colonel Barrett issued a firm order to not fire unless first fired upon. Hopelessly outnumbered by the advancing militia, the British soldiers pulled back to the east side of the bridge where the 1836 obelisk now stands and hastily organized a defense. As the colonial column advanced to within about 80 yards of the British position, a succession of three shots rang out from the British side and landed in the river on the right of the advancing Minutemen. Luther Blanchard, a fifer from Acton, cried out that he was wounded. Major John Buttrick of Concord then gave the order to fire. This was the first time colonial militiamen were ordered to fire on British soldiers. In all, 12 British soldiers were hit, three of them fatally. Four out of eight officers present were wounded. The rest of the British soldiers broke and fell back in disorder towards Concord. On the colonial side, Captain Isaac Davis and Private Abner Hosmer were killed. Four other militiamen were wounded. Lieutenant Colonel Smith and his column prepared to return to Boston. Companies wrapped up their search for arms and returned to the town center. Carts were procured for the wounded. By about noon, the column was reformed and Lieutenant Colonel Smith gave the order to march. They had 18 miles to go before they would reach the safety of Boston. The situation was about to get much worse as the British column moved out east from Concord Center on the road back to Boston. They were attacked by newly arrived Minute companies from Reading, Chelmsford, and Bavarica at the road junction called Miriam's Corner. The British had to pull their flank guard in to cross a brook. The colonists took advantage of this choke point and opened fire. The action is the start of what came to be known as the Battle Road. Companies from Framingham and Sudbury arrived from the south and engaged the British column on their right flank at a place called Brooks Hill. Companies from Concord, Lincoln, Bedford, and Acton, who had fought at Northbridge earlier that morning, were also in pursuit, as were Reading, Chelmsford, and Bilbrica. Meanwhile, three companies from the town of Woburn had just arrived and were soon to make their presence felt. As the British column descended to Lincoln Bridge, the Woburn companies took a position on the high ground east of the bridge. They had somewhere between 180 and 200 men and may have also been joined by companies from Framingham. The Woburn companies opened a brisk fire, then fell back toward the second turn in the road, firing from new positions as opportunity allowed. As the British column plunged ahead through the turn of the road, they were soon met by heavy fire from their left. One participant said the British suffered, quote, more deadly injury than any one place from Concord to Charlestown. Eight or more of their number were killed on the spot, and no doubt many wounded." Unquote. The running battle continued all the way back to Boston that night after seven. British casualties were 73 killed, 174 wounded, 26 missing, 
with 49 colonials killed, 41 wounded, and 5 missing. On the night of April 19, 1775, as General Gage looked across the water, he would have seen enemy campfires springing up in the landscape surrounding Boston. 4,000 Minutemen and Militiamen answered the Lexington alarm and saw combat on that day. 20,000 overall answered the call. They arrived in the area within the week and immediately began establishing siege operations under the direction of the Provincial Congress and the Committee of Safety. The siege of Boston had begun. Within a month, there was the Battle of Bunker Hill, and on July 3rd, George Washington rode out in front of the troops at Cambridge Common, drew his sword, and took command of the Continental Army. Please subscribe to our channel. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up, and you can always comment below.